two, one. So that's what we're doing tonight. We're live. Yeah, we're live. Seven thirty. You can pick your whiskey. I'm just gonna check audios quick. All right. All right. We'll do one for old Brian. Gotcha. Facebook's good. And YouTube, just checking audios. And YouTube's good. So we are all set, live to go. All good on the audio. So thank you guys for tuning in. This is episode number 10 already. Double digits. Double digits of whitetails and whiskey. Got a little docket tonight. A couple of topics and stuff we got. Questions we've been here and stuff like that. Um, started off with the whiskey of the night. Nate says we're going to do one for Brian tonight. One of my dad's staples is the granddad 100 bonded. And it hasn't been featured yet, so... Evening, Derek. Glad to Derek. see you back on. Probably out of the back country. He's probably been up hunting or fishing or something. Working. I'm sure he has, man. Yeah. But, yeah, so uh, I guess, I don't know, Nate, you started off with uh, what you had happen the other night. Or not you, but your wife. Good things. Good things. And then one not so good thing. Yep. But, uh, yeah, so seeing I tag my buck um obviously i want to get out there hunting so i didn't went on a couple buddy hunts with some friends nothing really transpired from it we saw some small deer and doe but uh i was trying to talk my wife into <laughs> going out and yep. trying to get one um it's been a while it's, well she's only ever killed one deer with her bow mm -hmm. and uh i was with her actually with her first deer with her bow we were both buddied up in a double ladder stand on uh my grandfather's old property mm -hmm. so, but um finally kind of got her talked into it she's had a little rough patch there where she struggled with um i guess making some poor shots and unfortunately not being able to find the deer and she's kind of slowly getting getting over you know that just being part of the game and so she decided she was gonna go shoot her bow and if she felt like her shots were up to par for her that she was gonna let me take her out on uh, monday so she shot her bow she shot great right on the right on the insert of the uh, 3d deer and she says all right i feel confident i think i could do it and uh, i had a pretty good spot in mind with that kind of cooler temperatures coming in throughout Monday and uh, Tuesday. So we went out Monday. Um, I set her up in one of my favorite stands, actually the stand I shot my bow buck in last year. Mm -hmm. um, it was just an 18 foot ladder stand and I'm sitting in and I went up on top, just sitting over a cut bean field. Wasn't really anticipating much and sitting there and I'm looking on my phone and I don't know, it was probably, about, I don't know, it's the whole time change. It gets dark at 5.30, so it's probably pushing 5 o'clock. Yep. My phone starts ringing. I'm looking at it, and I said Eliza, and I don't know. I was zoning out on something. I was like, what the hell is Eliza calling me for? And then, I was like, and then it just hit me. I was like, <laughs> Ain't no I was like oh, wait a minute. So I, I was like, hey, did you get one? And she goes, oh, my God, I got one. He's down. So, and that was actually her first bow buck. Mm -hmm. um, she did a great shot. Um, thing... I don't know, went 20 yards. Yep. Got tangled up in some vines and died there. Um it was uh it was cool. She was all excited. It definitely got her confidence up and hopefully I can go on a few more hunts with her that uh you know, now that this has opened up her confidence. That was a big thing for her, was her confidence for a while. Yep. And then uh of course us hunting with you letting us uh, go out there and her take a doe with her rifle yep. last year. So that was a confidence booster. And now she got, she, she did it all by herself. I wasn't with her or anything. And she, she did great. And she got her first bow buck, mm -hmm. nice little basket rack, six point. And, yep. uh, she was uh, ecstatic. Absolutely. And of course we had to bring the baby over to the in-laws, uh, Dave and Jean. They're always up for watching little Owen. Yep. So it's nice to have that so we can get out and do things like this. But uh, so we had to go show her dad, uh, 
her deer and pick up Owen. And then I got a deer <laughs> on the way home about three quarters of three quarters of a mile from my house. Doe just ran right into the side of my truck. I couldn't really do much about it. Yeah, let the old Chevy in. And uh <laughs> yeah, crushed her. She didn't she didn't go 20. But uh yeah, so that was a, a little bit of a damper on on the night, but you know, it's all right, it's what we got insurance for. You yep. know, and uh but yeah, that was kind of I mean just got so much going on right now. I really haven't been focusing a whole lot on hunting, seeing I got my buck and I was it was it was great to get lies out and do all that and yeah have some fun out in the woods. No, we're doing we're doing well this year, dude. I mean, can't really can't complain about any of it. No, it's it's been good. Yeah. I know for some people it's been a grind, but there's been some big deer hitting the dirt the last couple of days with these fronts and stuff coming in. Yeah, some of the stuff I've been seeing pop up on the Facebook feed there, mm-hmm. some of the pages I follow, or there's some studs going down. Yep. Yeah, like I said this morning, I was at work and I'm sitting there with the guys drinking coffee and I'm like, oh my gosh, dude, like this is the morning that I want to be out there right now. It was like 26 degrees, hard frost, Mm -hmm. nice steady wind, not super calm. I was like, this is what dream mornings are made of. Oh yeah. But, you know, hopefully we'll get some fronts with the gun and, you know, I'll be going out with the pistol this year again. Mm -hmm. So we'll see if, if I can get something again this year with the pistol, that'd be cool. It's always a little. It's always fun with a gun. Mm-hmm. As much as I love bow hunting, it just kind of puts a little. I don't know. It puts a little, obviously puts a little different twist to it because you got some range, you know. Yep. You can set up a little different. You can actually. I'm not saying you can't kill a deer from the ground with your bow. Um, Jesse does it all the time. Yep. But it's it's definitely a little more difficult to get the deer within 20. At least, you know, if you have an odd wind and you don't have a stand right for that wind on your property, you can just pack a lawn chair and go set up on the set of hedgerow. right end of the hedgerow that you're hunting. And, mm-hmm. you know, and gun gives you a little more options. Rifle does for yeah. sure. Yeah, get the old five-gallon bucket out. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. But, no, I shot that doe a couple of years ago with the rifle, dude. It's just laying prone in the ditch. Had a doe group coming off, no stand there. Did you have way. like a white bed sheet over you or something? I did. I've done that the before snow, in the yeah. snow. I've done that in the same kind of spot with the snow with the muzzle loader, and they just weren't. They were a little too far. Yeah. But yeah, I went out there and uh, snow camel, and then threw that white that white sheet over the top of me. But YouTube line coming in. Uh, Derek obviously said, "Hey, Plap's tuning in." Hey, Plap. Plap also says, "Grandpa said Lizo was shooting good that day." Obviously, got the job yeah, done. Yeah, she got the job done. <laughs> yep. Derek says, congrats, and then, oh, shit, probably with your truck. Yeah. Uh, Derek says, not seeing shit. It's been in the low teens every morning with a high of 20 during the day. doesn't help. We got four to six of crunchy snow. Crunchy is tough yeah, to get around and getting in. Yep. 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 <clears throat> Especially but. with, I guess, your style of hunting, because I think where Derek is, he can oh, do he's a going little, uphill or, he can, yeah. he can do a little more stalking, I think, where – He's at over there in yeah, Glass and Idaho. Uh, Idaho, yeah, Idaho. Yeah, but he hunts a couple surrounding states because getting truck and drive, you know, yeah. you got. Which we talked about that, which it's not really in the cards for me, but yeah, we've talked about that. Yeah, I was I was just about ready to pull the trigger on Ohio this week with this front coming in with the hurricane and everything, or a tropical storm, whatever it is. But um, no, it it didn't work out. My wife's on call this week been dealing with some stuff at work with her on call week so i'm kind of glad that i'm here and didn't take off with it but we'll see maybe next week i could light out for like ohio or pennsylvania i got my eye on a couple pieces of state land in pennsylvania that are a little bit closer to so yeah i'll just wait till next year we go on a buddy hunt it's more fun with a buddy yep absolutely (laughs) absolutely no it'd be nice to chase something and of course next year we'll be grinding after a deer here and won't be tagged out yet we'll be sitting here going we got pennsylvania next week or ohio (laughs) yeah haven't punched the tag here but that's obviously how it goes i don't know last year i got my buck november 5th and then this year i got it on the october 27th so Mm -hmm. it still leaves a couple weeks yeah well i went the whole season last year yeah yeah you got a little picky you got pretty picky last year, which is all right. Got a little picky, but it all works out. But, um, yeah, and then other than that stuff going on, I've just been kind of working, um, you know, trying to get 
stands checked or not stands, but cameras checked here and there when I'm out and can get stuff checked. Uh, I had to track a deer the other night with a neighbor, which brings up a good topic of having good neighbors to work with. Ones that keep an eye on your back door, or your property, ones that call you when something runs on your property, you know, all that stuff helps with those good neighbor relations. And I helped a neighbor of mine that I haven't seen in uh, like probably four years now since he just moved to the neighborhood. This, shot is, a deer. this is the same night Liza got hurt. Yeah, they were they were out that night. It was because I apologize for not being able to come over and see Liza's deer because I had to go track. Yeah. So, yeah, he shot right. a doe and followed up. It was tough blood, tough blood trailing, and uh, we got her. So that all worked out good. Um, but, yeah, the big thing was just having good neighbors, you know, people you can call, you know, and having that good relationship. And some make it easier than others. Some make it not so easy. But, hey, I've uh, I've uh, learned that in my life that, uh, you know, you can be best friends with somebody for, you know, nine months out of the year. But when that three months of deer season rolls around, you can turn to enemies pretty quick. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, some people, yeah, for sure. For sure. And again, it's just a respect thing. You yeah. just respect my side. I respect your side. And, yeah. you know, that's how, that's how we always do, do it. it. That's so, the best way to do it. And luckily, we got a lot of the issues out that we've had in the past. Um, with certain individuals in the area and stuff like that so mm-hmm. luckily knock on wood even in jimmy everybody walks out, watches out for each other over there now which yeah. is helps everybody keep a a safer hunting too you know and that's the other big thing with giving a call not as much with the bow but with the gun you know you don't know where somebody's hunting and everything like that mm-hmm. so that's a big thing with with that too is safety for us for sure so, so yeah jimmy o said Evening, gents. Evening, Jimmy. Derek says, 90% of my hunting is stalking, not sitting in a stand. So, yeah, so he's glassing, probably looking, trying to find game, big open country, Mm -hmm. you know, burn areas. I know they've been having some big burns out there. Elk, muleys. Yep. Last couple years. And then Derek actually brought that up just now in the comments on YouTube. Said, did you show Nate pictures of that elk with rice breast? So, yeah, so Derek messaged me the other night. And um, I'll show it to him right now. And he was saying, hey, what's white worms in elk meat? And then he said rice breast. And I thought rice breast was only in waterfowl. Um, But we did a little bit of digging, you know, him and me and came to the same conclusion that, you know, deer can get it, elk can get it by eating vegetation that's got the nematode in it, which causes the parasite um, or drinking water. But no, it was... It was really odd, and I think Derek said he got a sal- his buddy that shot the elk that had it at a salvage tag for it. But it was it was bizarre, dude. I've never seen anything like I've seen it kind of in waterfowl before, but never in. This is more of a water parasite. Uh, waterfowl because it's in the vegetation and water and stuff like that a lot. So if it's got that nematode which needs moisture, um, you know that's where they pick it up on uh i'll look for a picture plap says now when you guys walk into a new property to hunt what kind of work does it take to figure out how to hunt that land plap with a good comment i like one, that Plapp. uh i guess i w- I, i'm a i'm a big fan of onyx and using uh topo um i use a topo map to kind of look for you know geographical features um, to set up whether it's you know i mean a good ex- i guess a good example i guess if it's a you know with last year with like the my muzzleloader buck i mean it just kind of depends on what's around you know i mean do you got a is there a food source that's kind of hanging on there like a is it you know what time of year is it um the time of year i guess for an example with that muzzleloader buck was there was standing corn um, I, um, got permission for one day to go out there and hunt. Um, cause I drove by the property multiple times and I saw the standing corn and it was, you know, late December. So yeah, it was a holiday season. I mean, depending on the time of year and just kind of knowing what is, what the deer are a little more interested in might alter a little bit of how I sit it. Mm-hmm. Um, but uh, definitely number one would probably for me would be looking at the topo some geographical features um trying to set up something that was gonna you know pinch them deer down or funnel them down 
to me and uh and then weather watching yep. you know just hunt it on the right days and the right winds yep and then obviously if it's a property a new piece that you got the more you hunt it the more you're gonna learn about it yep you know you yep. might set up in that pinch point and it's bow season and you know you're them deer just keep walking you know 50 yards away and you need to move that stand 20 yards and you just make that adjustment the following year or during season or however i mean i I mean, I guess that's just a few of the things that I do when I go into a new piece. Yeah, so looking at new pieces and stuff, that's something I do all the time with the consulting and stuff like that. And like you said, it starts with that aerial image. And then I want to look at access points. You know, is it just one side of a property you can access from? Is it some properties I've been to, it's like a whole long right away to get back down into the property? You know, and then again, like you said, topography, how does it lay? And then trying to lay out the access is the, the first you know, kind of work and stuff like that after the, the pre-scout and try to get a feel for it. And then put, put boots on the ground. Mm-hmm. You know, you got to go look at it. I mean, as much as, you know, you want to pick it apart. And most of the time, if you start looking at them enough, you can start fleshing out, like you said, the topography and some of the fields and stuff like that and habitat. But putting those boots on the ground, you might find like the right tree, you know, that you didn't even see might have been on the map or the right spot when you start looking at it and go, man, this is the spot that I can get into, get out of, hunt with this wind or multiple winds maybe with the way it lays out. Um, that's kind of the first thing when I'm going into a new piece, you know, like I said, you're you know, consulting for clients and stuff like that. It's all access based. And then we start laying out improvements, you know, down the road with it. If it fits for them, it fits for their budget. You know, a lot of people have a hard time as it is with a, you know, a land payment and taxes here in New York. Sometimes the budget's not as, is fat for doing some of those property improvements. So, you know, but well, you, definitely the cheapest way. I just probably just look at an aerial view. Yep. Just look at geographical features that, you know, just help you funnel them deer to you. Yep. Yep. Saddles, benches, all that good stuff. <clears throat> so, but yeah, well, that's where I would start with a new piece. And then, and I guess, you know, like if it's a new piece that like we were saying that you, can continuously hunt for years like a lease Mm -hmm. or is it a piece that you have like a weekend permission or are we just going to ohio picking out some state land and we're trying to make something happen in four days yeah i mean all this it's all there's definitely different situations to how you know but definitely number one would be looking at a topo map and just trying to figure out the best geological feature to set up on Mm -hmm. and then just start with that yeah. And just hunt it smart with weather and wind. Yep. No, I agree 100 percent on that. But yeah, this is the picture I found of that rice breast. So those are all parasitic worms. I'll try to show it to the camera too. Hopefully you guys aren't eating dinner right now. <laughs> but it's real distinctive. It looks like grains of rice in the meat. Yeah. And yeah. then when you cross section it, they're all laid in and almost like little fat deposits. Yeah. Yeah. New tag. Thanks for sharing that with me. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> sorry. Animate pasta tonight. <laughs> I ate before I came over. Yeah. But um but yeah, so that's that's you know, something I would wouldn't recommend necessarily looking up, but something to look out for when you're, you know, processing your deer and stuff right, like yeah, that is always abnormalities, yeah. you know, infections, you know. Well, I had a scare and it was it was kind of messed up how it all worked out, but I was, it was a few bow seasons ago, and I was cooking up some venison, and it was a backstrap, mm-hmm. and, you know, sitting there seasoning it, just had it in the pan, I just cut it into medallions, and I threw some salt on it, I walk away, I come back, and I start seeing these little rice things, like, it's almost like they were just popping out of nowhere, like, like they were, like, working their way out of the meat, and I was like, I was like, that ain't right. So I ended up I ended up getting a little freaked out by it. I wasn't mm-hmm. gonna eat it, kind of grossed me out. So I got the whole deer together and I ended up throwing the whole deer out. Well, come to find out, my wife puts little rice chunks in the salt so it doesn't harden up. The rice will absorb. <laughs> so I ended up wasting an entire freaking deer over that. But I don't know, I was just trying to, I guess I was trying to be safe or whatever. I don't know how the rice got through the salt shaker. 
or whatever. Yeah, but that's that, may, maybe it wasn't the rice, but that's I think that's what we determined it was because I it was it was uh, it was uh, you know, kind of embarrassing to talk about. You know, oh, big bag hunter. You know, no, but oh, it was. Yeah. Uh, but I wanted to be safe. I didn't want to eat it. It kind of grossed me out by the looks of it. Oh yeah, you know, and then I was poking it, and it was soft. Yeah, because the moisture, you know, with the, <laughs> and I was like, I don't know, and then I don't. Know, it was it was kind of a funny story, but yep. yeah, I got this whiskey <laughs> sitting here before I spill it. So because we haven't done our whiskey, but uh, here's to everybody that has tagged, and good luck to everybody that's still out there plugging the woods. Still got another what ten days left or so before mm-hmm. gun season. So plenty Not of time. A, yeah, plenty of time. Sorry. No, all good, man. Oh, all right. I cut you off there. No, but no, good. but to do this right for Brian, we would technically need a Mountain Dew chaser, is what I was getting at. But I don't, I don't think I don't we think have. I, I don't think I got a Mountain Dew. Uh, Brian, just just the old granddad for today. Granddad with a Dew chaser usually. What's he call him? Whiskey Dews. Whiskey Dews. Absolutely. <laughs> and uh, Brian is actually onto something with the Mountain Dew. For a little more history on the whiskey. Cause I didn't realize it, but I think you might have told me. Mm-hmm. But come to find out that Mountain Dew was actually originally made to be a whiskey chaser mm-hmm. before it was actually a soda. Yep. yep. So if you actually look up the history of Mountain Dew, it was actually made to compare with whiskey. Yep. Yep. And the name's even derived from Mountain Dew, meaning like the moonshine making up in the hills, Mountain Dew. Yep. That's kind of a little little cool whiskey tip fun fact i guess for for today's podcast yeah absolutely but yeah so yeah we're like we were saying with that you know got these fronts coming in if you still have a tag in your hand i'd be really watching this weather coming up this weekend it's gonna hit just right you know for guys that work nine to five monday through friday you got that big you know tropical storm rolling up the coast you got good weather coming in for saturday sunday monday that whole stretch coming up the end of you know archery season it looks great for us yeah yeah the weather's looking good yeah so sure i mean i i was i was ecstatic about monday afternoon and tuesday this week if mm-hmm. i could if i could have put 12 hours in the tree stand tuesday i probably would have yep had another tag in your pocket yeah yeah but, uh, no it's i can't get the wife to sit 12 hours well, you got the kid too. It makes it a little trickier. Yeah. But got, hey, got her to sit for a couple, and uh, she made mm-hmm. it happen. Absolutely, absolutely. But yeah, and then that's the thing too with the rut. I mean, like we always talk about, it doesn't matter, you know, how hot it is or how crazy the woods is getting right now. Um, you can't throw caution to the the wind. Literally, you know, you still got to hunt smart mm-hmm. because you know, like you said, I think you said last podcast or maybe it was two ago. You know, you still got to get the doe beat, even though that buck's all wound up, maybe stupid coming in behind her or something, or he might even just be cruising by. He's still not going to be throwing caution to the wind. So you still got to hunt smart with it. Yeah, hunt smart. I mean, if if that doe's, you know, getting pushed around by the buck, I mean, her senses are still in tune. And if she, if she crosses your path, I mean, she's, she's still going to pick up on it, mm-hmm. you know, unless she's going Mach 9. Yeah. I mean, if she's just kind of getting bumped around, she's still, she knows what's going on. She's been there, done that. Yep. You know, so she's still thinking about her well-being while right. <laughs> while they're messing around out there, for right. sure. I got the Facebook comments pulled up. Mike King says, what are you guys drinking tonight? Just tuned in. We're drinking Granddad Bonded uh, 100 Proof um, is the, the whiskey of the night tonight, which is one of my dad's go-to staples. He's, Mike says you drink a camo bush lattes. You gotta love the lattes. You gotta love a camo latte. And then my mom and dad, or mom and Rebecca chime in and says they're grandpa dues. Grandpa dues. Granddad. They're grandpa dues. Uh, Got it. Okay. Got it. Granddad yep. dues. Yep. Grandpa dues. Yeah. But no, they're always, like I said, that's something that, uh, shoot, that's been dad's go to since he switched off a turkey. Yeah. He's a, uh... He's gotten me in trouble once or twice with it. That's for sure. Yeah, it can be. It can be. It can be. Uh, Jimmy O commented in, I've had to adjust for deer movement a little bit. What are your thoughts on stand movement during this part of the season? Moving the stands or just moving stand to stand? 
I think he's talking about adjusting the movement. So I'm thinking moving stands. Maybe he's like you said, he's going through a pinch point or something or an he's area, just, and he's a little too just far out, out for archery. Just move it. Yep. Just get down yeah. and move it. If you got the right conditions, you know, um, midday, I'd move stands, dude, in the dark. Wouldn't necessarily recommend it, especially by yourself. Um, I've done stands in the dark, done them in like this monsoon rain we're going to have. It's going to suck. Yeah, I mean, you but can I've go done to, them in pouring rain. You can go to extremes and everything, but yep. I mean, honestly, if you're getting in there, getting it up, moving it, you know, you know, as long as you're not in there, I guess leaving a whole bunch of scent behind. Like you're in there with a wad of chewing, spitting all over everything, yeah. or um, I don't know, bring your lunch out there and leaving your wrappers everywhere. Yeah. You know, as long as you're just you know. You know, good woodsman etiquette. You're out there and you move your stand 20 yards so you can get closer to the majority of the deer movement. Mm-hmm. I don't think it's going to affect anything. Yeah. And I would I would say if you, you're seeing movement like that, like have that exact tree in mind. Like you said, don't be stumbling around out there trying to find the right tree that they're going past. Do right. a little bit of that scouting from your current stand to try to figure out where you're going to probably put that stand yeah, definitely put a little thought into it because if you do move it you're going to want it there probably the next season mm-hmm. so i mean don't move it you know 10 yards one way into a tree that's you know half the size of yourself yeah you know don't move it to a tree where you're going to stick out like a sore thumb yeah you know you still want to think of cover and mm-hmm. stuff like that but yeah yeah and uh i definitely don't think moving your stand this time of year i mean even if you did it in the <laughs> middle of the day you know i mean the, obviously the bucks are cruising and stuff but i mean even just making some noise in the woods just ra- rustling some leaves around might draw some attention honestly yeah so <laughs> it's a it's a crazy time of year but yeah i don't think it would affect anything yeah no i i, I move stands during mid-season but i also have two which is handy to have you know a tool in the toolbox I got a set of sticks, and then I use a uh, a lone wolf. It's a sit and climb or whatever they call them. Um, but I use that to use as kind of a mobile setup. I've used it a few times, you know, put me in positions to take deer and shot a couple coyotes. I shot two coyotes out of, mo- out of a mobile setup, I guess you'll call it, sticks and a hang on and going out and setting it yeah. before the hunt. Um so I think there's a lot of, you know, value in that. Moving a ladder stand is going to be obviously more noise, a little more clunk. You know, it might be good for that. I know a lot of guys, that's where some guys we know have switched over to saddles for most of their hunting, you know, just because of that easier, you know, flexibility with some stuff. Um, but I like my tried and true ladder stands, especially on, you know, family property, leases, permission, you know, Stuff like that that you got a little bit more control with and have figured out for a few seasons, especially. Mm-hmm. Once you start to iron out those spots, you know, it's good to put the the stuff in it. Looks like he's talking about a box blind. Yep. So, little Otis. So, I know Jimmy's a, a client of mine. Um, even with that crazy wind. Um I think he was talking about Monday and Tuesday when I brought that up. Oh. I'm not sure where Jimmy hunts out there. of. We had about a 9 to 10 mile an hour wind, steady west, northwest. Yeah. There was one day, though, that it was breezy. I forget which night it was. But, uh, but um, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I'm not sure where Jimmy's hunting or what the wind was doing there. But, yeah, when uh, me and my wife went out, it was 9, maybe 12 miles an hour max. Mm-hmm. Which, I mean, you get up into that, we'll say, 7 to 12 mile an hour wind range. You usually have a very steady directional wind, mm-hmm. which makes your hunting, I guess, a little more, I guess, safe. It's not so switchy when yeah. you get below that 7 mile an hour. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, so Jimmy was saying he had 15 to 25 Monday and then 10 to 15 on Tuesday. Yeah. So he's a little bit closer to the lake though. So he gets a yeah, little bit more push from that. More. But yeah, yeah, we did out here in, uh, I guess, Ontario County. We didn't uh, get quite that. We didn't quite have, I mean, 10 to 15 maybe yep. on Tuesday. I can mm-hmm. see that. But yep. 10 to 15 wouldn't deter me from getting out during the rut. Yeah, I mean, that that helps, you know. Um, 
what was it? Saturday was the really, really windy one. Saturday afternoon. Yeah. It was so. really windy. And me and my wife were actually out setting that night. So, you know, doe hunting or whatever you want to call it. But, um, yeah, I mean, that's real. I mean, that's pretty windy. I don't really like setting stands in the extreme winds. No. I've done it. Not re- necessarily saying it's a good idea or condoning it, but yeah. I've done it before. But, um, Jimmy says, little Otis box blind is 60 to 80 yards from the poplar at the end of the plot. Put up a pop-up on the other side and still seeing beef and traffic by the pop-up. Cell cams are great for the instant kind of feedback. Yeah, I mean, if you can get a, you know, I know a lot of guys are hunting out of, you know, pop-up stuff like that. I think they're a little tricky to shoot vertical bows out of. I think crossbows you can shoot out of pretty, pretty decent. I don't bow hunt out of one. I would... I don't mind gun hunting out of them. Mm-hmm. You pop them up in a little brush patch and kind of brush them in in a corner of a field, yep. you know, a food source. Just kind of sit over it. Yep. I've put and, them on the back side of hedgerows and then shooting through the hedgerow. That way you're not, you're not you know, exposing, you're not exposing yourself as much. Um, or tucking them into corn. I really like tucking them into standing corn mm-hmm. where you can. That's that's just got to make sure you communicate with the farmer on that one. Yeah, before it gets wadded up in the combine. <laughs> you might piss them <laughs> off and lose permission on that one. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, during season moving, you know, I'm 100% for it if that's what you got to do, you know. And as you start to manipulate, you know, properties and start to do stuff, you're going to have a little bit of that, like you said, that figuring out and how it how it works and flows with some of the improvements you make too. And the deer are going to work and flow with you. Mm-hmm. I mean, you move a blind – I mean, something's going to check it out. They're going to figure it out. You know, within that next week, most deer in the area are going to figure out that, okay, there's something different over there. And they're going to investigate it. And, you know, as long as you're using good woodsmanship and good woodsman, you know, etiquette in the woods, I don't really feel like it should bother them too much. Mm -hmm. No, I agree. I agree with that for sure. But no, good, good comments. Like I said, I like. I like Plaps thing with laying out and looking at new pieces. That's great information for people. And then moving stands. Yeah, I wouldn't be afraid to, you know, but I'm, you know, not saying also charge 200 yards deep into a bedding area and plop yourself up in it either. You still got to be able to get on and off of it Mm -hmm. where you set it up, you know, and change your location. So So your minor movements, if it's a major move, like what Ben was just talking about. Mm Mm-hmm. You might want to wait till the following season. Maybe just if you have the means of like a climber, maybe just move a climber in. I mean, or if you <laughs> want, if that, you want to but... throw if you want to throw a hail mary on it and do that, and if you got the right conditions to go in to that bedding with like one of these prime fronts coming or ones that we had, might be the time you do it. But that's it. Once that happens, you you're gonna burn it. Yeah, yeah, you don't want to blow that out. No, yeah. so sometimes it's but, worth the Hail Mary. Hey. If you got the right observations and the right, you know, stuff pointing you in that direction with it. That's that's half the fun, you know. Yep. Is uh, making these plans, and I've done some stuff that, you know, I guess you, like Ben was saying, like a Hail Mary move, like mm-hmm. just getting frustrated with what was going on, and I was like, you know what, I just need to do this. You just, you just do it, and sometimes it worked out, and sometimes I feel like it was the wrong move to do, and I guess you don't really know that 100% until you do it, and then you learn from it. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yep. It's definitely, definitely situational, but if you're just moving a stand, I don't know, 30, 40 yards, yeah. I don't think it's going to bother anything. Yeah. yeah. As long as you're you know trying to be you know decent about it. Got a comment come in and blip in on the Facebook line from Kyle. I said, I tend to follow thermals more than winds. Even with high winds, our mountains and ridges blow winds one way, and then 300 yards is blowing a completely opposite way. Well, it's a long comment. i got to see more. Uh, my farm spots are a little more predictable. Uh, I'm also a ground and pound guy. Never much for stands. I do have some that stay up but I feel as if the time of the year is being mobile pays off that 70 plus degrees last weekend did not do any favors, but cell cams have been blowing up the last 20 hours. I'm 80% public as well. So, I mean, with the public, you got to go find the deer. I mean, you're not, you know, doing any improvements. You're not, 
you know, you're hunting with, you know, everybody I mean, else. Cell cams, your best friend when it comes to public. Yeah. Um, yeah, if you can keep them hidden not, and stuff like that. You're not going in and out. Um, I know it, there's always that chance of someone stealing it. Mm-hmm. But I definitely think cell cams, if you're hunting public, are the way to go. If you can kind of get them in there and then just kind of get some deer movement. Yep. You know, or try and pattern a buck somewhat with a cell cam or having one go through. And then you just move in with your, right. well, you know, your mobile setup or yeah well tomes we were saying we gave him a shout out i think last podcast i'll shout him out again he put a cell cam back on a piece of public um i think he said for the last three or four years and had been getting decent bucks back there but finally had one he wanted to go chase back in that area slotted in might have even been a buck he had from previous years that was calling that home and slotted in on him and whacked him i think that was right that was early he got him early i think that was a week before we shot that little bit of that front right before we we went out and tagged our bucks Mm -hmm. so i think it was like mid uh, mid october and he's out grinding right now and uh like he's in ohio now he was in indiana he had a rough going indiana um taylor that we shoot leagues with shot one in indiana shot a nice buck nice and then uh yeah and i think they're in ohio now living the life then guys just get on the road and go hunt deer yeah god bless their wives and girlfriends yeah yeah for sure Uh, it's kind of like my dream in my retirement in 34 years yeah (laughs) but yeah so with the with the thermals and stuff like that you know i talk about cheating that a lot with the wrong wind stands and stuff i call them Mm -hmm. you know where you get it up and out over the top of you in the morning you know some spots uh, mountains and ridges yep and it sounds like he might be yeah that's a little i mean we're out here downstate or out east a little bit more something like that where we are yeah but yeah but you still get i mean it doesn't towards like bristol or we get some of these drum ones you still get pretty good thermal pulls you get in some of the ditch beds you get the thermal pull down Mm -hmm. you know or get rising off well i mean you get into the mountains and stuff i mean you're talking about a little different hunting you're talking thousand acre woodlots yep. i mean them deer are, you know they're not in these you know these little hundred, hundred acre, acre wood blocks that we're hunting yep you know where most of our pieces are i mean these are mm-hmm. he says montgomery county yep the, the foothills of adirondacks yep yeah so you're talking thousands and thousands of acres of just nothing Woods but timber and no ag and no ag so you're you're hunting the mountain deer. Yep, that, all that's, goes... that's definitely a, a different game for yep. sure. Yep. <laughs> Seven thousand, yeah, seventy six hundred acre woodlot. Yeah, that's 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 a tough one. And that and and that goes right back to your topography thing, though. You know what I mean? That goes back to hunting the topography, hunting your benches, your saddles, you know, mm-hmm. and where you can get in and you know use those thermals and stuff to your advantage, like he's saying, mm-hmm. you know, more than the wind because the hills are going to pull it just because mm-hmm. of the size that he's getting there in the foothills of the Adirondacks. So yep. definitely, definitely don't overlook thermals, dude. I recommend that to everybody. And uh, they're a little tricky to understand, but once you kind of figure them out, it's definitely, mm-hmm. definitely will help you out in your game. If you can figure them out. I mean, the simple, the simplest way to put it. And I mean, you can go completely in depth with it, you know, a lot further, but it's going to rise in the morning if you have sunny conditions, it's going to rise faster and quicker. Mm-hmm. Um, and if you have some wind, if you have a still morning. Heat rises. Yep. Heat rises, basically. But if you have a still morning, um, I've dropped milkweed. And if there's no wind or movement of that temperature, or if you're on the back side, like if you're on the far west side of a hill and the sun's coming up in the east, that air is not warming up. That air is still cooling. That's the same place you're going to see the frost hang on last and stuff mm-hmm. like that. So you got to also, you know, keep that in mind, you know, with your thermal and stuff like that too. If you got an east facing spot or a semi east or southeast facing spot, it's lot going to rise to quicker. Yeah, that has a lot to do with the sun. Yep. Sun and that warming temperature. Mm-hmm. Or if you had, let's just say you had that front blow in that we got coming up and that temperature is you know, still dropping or going to 
you know, kind of stay steady and drop throughout the day, you're not going to get as much of a thermal pull. Mm -hmm. I get a lot more thermal pull on day two, three out of the front where it's starting to almost ramp back up again with the temperature because I got predictable conditions. Yep, pinch points are my friend. Hell yeah, pinch points. They're everybody's friend. <laughs> pinch points, <laughs> but yeah. Yeah, but in the, the big woods, the, the, those hills and stuff, those bench shelves on the side hills and stuff like that, for sure. Mm -hmm. um, and then if anybody's, you know, not too in tune with thermals and stuff, I mean, you know, just go grab yourself a milkweed pod and <laughs> bring it out with you. And actually, Ben was going to bring that up in a podcast. I don't know if he's got one laying around here. He's got an old tin cup special yep. that he, uh, I don't know, if, I don't even know if they make them anymore. But the old, you get them on Amazon. <laughs> the old um, rubber penny, not to steal your thunder yeah. here. This is all Ben. He's he showed me this, but the old penny uh, savers, the little rubber things. He full change have, purses. Change yep. purses. Well, get a pull yourself some milkweed. Pull the the hairs out of it, the seeds. Shove yep. it in there. And some morning when you're sitting in the stand, just pull it out and just let it float. And if that milkweed starts going up, then your thermals are rising. If it starts dropping, then your thermals are probably dropping. Yep. Yep. So, yeah, no, there. that's something that, you know, I've had on. It sits right on my, my vest. It's up in my, my hunting clothes and my tote. But um, it's got a little, I mean, they're the change purses. They're oval, oblong. They have a slit in them. And then you squeeze them on the sides and then you have access to the change or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, but that's what I keep my milkweed in yeah. um, when I'm in the stand. Mine just happens to be green <laughs> because that's the color I bought off Amazon three, four years ago. Yeah. And then I, I honestly just, I did a little experiment to see if the milkweed would, I guess, hold. I actually jarred it, mm -hmm. I guess. Oh, you could jar I guess, it, I, it. I guess for for us hippies out there, yep, cured it in yep. a <laughs> in a uh, mason jar, and uh, yeah, it it it's two years old and it still works great and stays in the jar and sealed. And yeah, that's why I keep the milkweed out. Jimmy says passion. coin purse. Yep, coin purse, man. <laughs> the old coin purse, old tin cup coin purse. Yeah. Yeah, maybe Jimmy, we'll, maybe you'll have we'll to look that we'll one up. <laughs> yeah, you'll have to look that one up on Amazon or something, Jimmy. Just type in coin purse. It'll, I think they'll probably come up. You'll see. And once you see it, you'll know. What I don't it even is. think it's a thing anymore. But that was like '90s. <laughs> that was when we were kids. The banks used to give them out for free when you. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Opened you get, your account. Yeah. You Open your account. You got a coin purse. Yep. It's a little rubber oval thing yep. with a slit in it. Yep. Uh, Platt had a comment. How many different bucks or deer have you seen at each stand before or after a kill? I think at each stand it varies. I mean, obviously you have some sets that are better than others. And I've almost found that the mornings, sometimes, I mean, it all, every hunt's different, but some of the mornings that I'd see less deer, but I'll see the right deer. And I find that more in mornings than afternoons. Afternoons, if I'm seeing a lot of deer, there's a lot better chance I'm going to see a good one. Yep. You know, um, but uh, morning time, it's almost unless there's a lot of bucks cruising just with the right conditions. But it's almost I see less bucks in the morning times. It's usually when I'll see one of my good bucks because I'm closer to where, you know, I anticipate one of those good bucks being that I'm chasing. Um, but uh, kind of answer his question uh hornet was the seventh buck i had in range this year mm -hmm. um so i had six smaller bucks that i let I go he, during i think he was getting it yeah. all before and after a kill yeah. so the difference that will will the deer movement be different after you kill an animal out of a stand I if that doe's still hot i've heard of those guys that dad shoots one one day son goes out shoots one the next day i mean i've 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 shot deer before and watched other deer just come over and smell them and just walk away or walk right by me. I don't, mm -hmm. I don't, I don't know. And you agree with me on this is that I don't, I don't think deer really comprehend death. No, nope. I don't, I don't think they, so I don't, I don't think killing a deer and the blood. I mean, I think a gut pile might draw some interest. I think that's more the predator scent that's laid with it, though. Could be. I don't know if it's necessarily the gut or the. But I don't. I don't think it'll scare them. 
I don't think I don't, it is. And again, I think I, I think, think it if, does. I think you're more more intrusive if you're not hunting or like Nate says that I call it the woodsmanship side of it with your stand location. You're more impactful if you're not paying attention to it on your access side and your woodsmanship side. You're going to pay for it in the long run more than shooting a deer out of a stand and then, you know, having the right conditions to go back to it. Mm-hmm. I think. But uh, Jimmy says, keep a couple milkweed pods in the pocket and then coin purse. Yep. That's just what I put it in. He says, he says, I'm 53. I know what a coin purse is. Heck, I still remember. Floorboard dimmer, night switches and trucks <laughs> with the old foot pedal. <laughs> yep. Well, my dad there, uh, Platt commenting in, he, uh, he, he probably will. He's 56, oh, yeah. so he's right there with you, Jimmy. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, that's, that's awesome. Uh, Dollar General. Apparently, they still sell them at Dollar General. Maybe Kyle Dollar says General. Dollar General is where I bought mine. So, mm-hmm. must be they still got the coin purses out there mm-hmm. floating around at Dollar General. Maybe I'll have to go check Dollar General. Yeah. Oh, we got some other comments here. Oh, my wife chimed in. Oh, sorry, Liza. Jumped over your comment. Can you talk about best times to use rattling antlers, grunts, bleats, and urine? Take it away, Nate. <laughs> <laughs> so, well, me, you had success this year, so actually, we'll, we'll let you kick it off. I've killed my last four bow bucks. I rattled them in. Um, it's situational. It's definitely time of year. You wanna, you. I mean, you don't want to go out there. And I, I say situational by I mean you got to know your property in the area you hunt to an extent. Um. I usually like to start calling right around that week of Halloween Mm -hmm. um, is when, and when I mean by calling, um, I'll let off, I'll I'll do a blind rattle. Um, I, I kind of grind the antlers. I don't so much smash them together and make a a heck of a lot of noise. I kind of try and make it, more sound like the deer's antlers are pushing against each other not so much like they're playing knights with their swords with their antlers because they're not rams they're not (laughs) reefing back and ramming each other and ramming each other and ramming each other they're locking heads they're pushing each other and those antlers are grinding and they i mean you'll get some slap so you obviously can make some noise and i've had a lot of luck with um rattling um grunt using a grunt call um, I usually only use a grunt call when I visually see a deer. I will not rattle if a deer is visually in sight. Mm-hmm. Um, I only use a grunt call. Um, and something that I found works really good, and it definitely depends on the deer's mood, um, is is if if you just let out kind of a, hey, I'm over here, grunt, just like a, you know, just a... Burp. And you get that buck to look back. Mm -hmm. If you can actually take your call apart and get fine tune that rubber band on it Mm -hmm. and just kind of get it to where you can just make that grunt a very small, like tick where you're only making like, you know how they, the grunt call you. If you could just get it to go uh, uh, just one of those little clicks and just kind of click at that buck. Yep. Drives them nuts. <laughs> that's, that's, that, grunt, man. that's a little. That's a little tip if you're for your calling that works really well for me. Uh, that just that little. If you got their attention and it does, you know, just give them that little uh, a few clicks, mm-hmm. and they it almost like pisses them off. It's almost like another deer is giving the other deer Tending the bird, grunt. you know. Yep. Like, and uh, so I've had some luck with that. And like I said, time of year, um, usually at least around me here in Ontario County in New York, it's, I usually start calling the uh, week of Halloween through probably, well, until I kill or until, um, gun season and then gun season i don't even bother because, i usually don't call much because now that we can shoot rifles i mean if he's within 200 yards i'm mm-hmm. kind of all right with them yep so 
And then yeah. bleats, I don't do much dough calling. I don't really use any fawn stuff. I don't. Yeah, so I like, I mean, we talked about it in our group chat. I like the, um, now I'll forget the name of it, the hooks, the hooks call, the hooks grunt call, hooks custom call grunt call. That's the one that I've liked. That's the one that I think does sound the best, you know, just, you know, from my experience and then hearing it over a distance, that's the grunt that I like to run. Um, I like the wooden body to it. Uh, I like the reed adjustment it has on it. It's got several slots to adjust it and keep it kind of that immature buck. You don't need to roll that. <laughs> good. Yeah, <sorry>. <laughs> That's <laughs> all good. I thought you were going to sneeze. Um, but I, I don't want to roll it, you know, all the way down and get that like deep bellowy. I haven't had much success with that at all. If you want to try blind calling, I guess maybe. Yep. I don't know. I want to be I want to be that 2-year-old buck that almost thinks he's too big for his britches. That way I'm calling in, you know, multiple deer. I am a big fan of um the the blind grunts um but with the scenario. Like I'll doe bleat and then I'll wait 30, 40 seconds, and then I'll do some of those, you know, like you said, those tick grunts, those those tending grunts, those tick, tick, tick. It almost sounds like it, you know, you're saying that, and that's almost like you blow into it. You're just trying it. to get that reed to just go. Just flap. Yep. Flap once. Yep. Yep, and if you listen A lot to of it, grunt calls won't allow you to do it. You have to find a call that kind of works for you. Mm-hmm. You got to. Doesn't freeze up. Yeah. Doesn't freeze up. Yeah. Because I know a lot of those cheaper calls, I can't get that. Yeah, that maybe tech. it's just me mm-hmm. and how I work things. But. Yeah. yeah, so I usually do like a like a doe bleat and then some you know some soft kind of tendon grunt clicks and then maybe I'll do like a little like a little like a deep almost like a some people call it like a breeding grunt or just a just a bellow grunt. But that's it. I mean, I won't be sitting there you know just playing it like a, a, a flute you know and just blowing into it. Just all willy nilly. You got to kind of almost uh, set the stage for it. Yeah, I think, I think a lot of people make that mistake when they're calling. I think a lot of people will overcall. Mm-hmm. Um, and then, especially if that deer is in eyesight, that deer senses are in such tune. Yep. That is once you got his attention, you kind of want to do as minimal as possible. Mm-hmm. And I think that's where that clicking kind of comes in, because. If he's looking back at you and grunt, boom, he's pinpointed you. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. He knows what tree you're in. I mean, that's why you can blind grunt deer, right? Or blind grunt call deer right to your tree. They yep. will pinpoint that location even though they can't see oh, you. Oh, yeah. So if you can see them, they're going to figure out where you're at real quick. Yep. So by just kind of getting their attention and then doing some clicks, maybe semi in their direction or even... You know, I've even like pointed my call the opposite way yeah, of them to try and sound like the deer is farther away than where I am. Yep, absolutely. So in hopes that they don't pinpoint me, yep. and it's it's very hard. Yep. <laughs> yeah, because they're they're no, good. At, I've, they're I've, good at what they do. I've grown it a couple right to the bottom of the tree. I mean, the bar buck over here, Bud, he came in on a blind grunt, uh, but he was an aggressive, you know fairly dominant buck that year on the farm too so and then yeah i mean it works but i've only called in let's see, one two three 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 bucks that's all i've called in well my buck this year i kind of had a really good feeling about blind calling over there because after if you watch some previous episodes um, after the second week of October, he was the only mature buck on that piece, uh, like 60 acres or yep. whatever it is. Mm-hmm. And he was hitting all the scrapes. Uh, he was, he was just running the show on that piece. Yep. So I kind of had an idea if he was around, if I, well, you called it, you said that was going to be the buck you were going to kill. <laughs> I, I could kind of tell, you know, he was very active. He was very aggressive. Yep. Just by the pictures and how frequently he was hitting scrapes. He was there during the day. He was rechecking scrapes at night. Like he was constantly patrolling. Yeah. He's a homebody. 
he was you know that's his piece and he wanted to make sure everyone knew it and he made sure everyone knew it mm-hmm. so you know trail cam pictures can also help you by looking at them and watching the deer movement and um you know possibly seeing how dom you know what is the dominant buck you know the dominant buck not, might not be the buck with the biggest rack yep you know the, the dominant buck you know is the one who is just just like I explained, he's the one that is most frequently up and moving. He's the one mm-hmm. checking his scrapes. He's the one checking his rub lines. He's the one checking the bedding. He's constantly patrolling his turf. And if you can come in there and sound like you want to challenge him for his spot, he's going to come right to you. And, and usually, that's... usually those aggressive bucks don't last, you know, in to getting into some of those older, older age classes because they get shot when they're younger because they're all full of piss and vinegar. Mm-hmm. You know, I see that a lot of times. And him being a six point might have been his saving grace till it could have been. It's <laughs> tough to say, you know, or you just to get where he was. Dude, he could have been whiffed four, yeah. five, six times. I know we got one that's been hit once, whiffed at least once, maybe twice, you yeah. know, that we got yeah. running around out there. I mean, and they're tough animals. Mm -hmm. um but i have specific bucks you know that i'm watching or looking at or whatever like uh curly specifically he's uh he's he's so subordinate i've seen him literally tuck his tail and run the other way when i had deer running and chasing and he's a big deer and he's a solid buck um but he is just he is not he's a pretty boy he doesn't want to get doesn't want to get his face dirty. You know, he's that friend of yours that you know has got to make sure his hair and everything is perfect before he and goes his rack out. Is pristine. You know, you know he's got to you know he's got to look good for the ladies when he goes out. He's just, yep. he's not just rolling off a his eight hour shift and just all right, let's go, guy. Yep. <laughs> Time to fight. <laughs> but uh, but no, and then when I had Hornet out in front of me that night that I shot him, I did a couple soft just just almost i call him kind of a contact grunt just a little brap brap just almost like another buck just kind of walking through that's just grunting as he's walking didn't even pick his head up the other buck that was out in the field at that time picked his head up and looked over but like i said you know when i was telling the story about him he really didn't care about the other deer on the field he was just out there eating that night you know he didn't care about the does he didn't care about the other bucks unless they got within you know eight ten yards of him then he kind of posture quick and walk them off just because he didn't want to be bothered i think by him but he was just out there feeding man that's all he was doing so um i don't know if he was aggressive i never had any history with that deer i was telling nate that the shed that is holding his phone up i found that uh would be three years ago so that would put him if that is his shed would put him at i would assume four years old um you know but i estimated them to be three so maybe it's not i mean it's tough to say when they're a yearling you know shed or whatever but uh, i had no history with hornet other than this summer going into the season he wasn't one that i had on the board or anything like that Mm -hmm. it just worked out right place right time um and then going back to you know bumping deer around i bumped him off one end of the farm and i did kill him on the complete opposite end of the farm Mm-hmm. you know where i killed him so maybe i did spook him out and maybe that would have spooked him onto a neighbor piece and a different scenario but um that's how it worked out with him i just kind of killed him on the opposite end so um and after i bumped him and then went back and looked at cameras after we took pictures that day up in the field i shot him in um he was on that plot three straight nights that was the third straight night he came out to that food plot that was the and second if, second if we, time in the last three days during if daylight. We were a little more advanced hunters, you would have had the information sooner. On the cell cam? Yeah, my <laughs> phone would have been going ba-ding, and I'd have been going, oh. <laughs> But the night I killed him, he came in from a different spot of the field, you know, and oh, we got Facebook comments. Uh, he came into a different spot of the field than he did on my trail camera, so... I didn't actually get a picture of him the night I shot him. Mm -hmm. So it just goes to show you too. You only see, like we talk about that 40 degree window or 60 degree window in front of your camera. That's it. That's all you get. We'll say it's 60 degrees. (laughs) I think that's, I think that's fair. Yep. 60 degrees. So there's 300, there's 300 degrees going on around it. Yep. I mean, yeah. So 
Yeah, and like I said, he was on that three straight nights, and I found that out after the fact. It was more of I hadn't put any sits on that end of the farm yet, and I had the right wind for that stand, Mm -hmm. and it all came together on him. So a couple couple questions commented in from Kyle's were first on that. My buddy Brian makes custom calls. He has a wooden hand-tuned grunt. His signature is a brass button on the reed itself, specifically designed for clicking. Hmm. I like it. Kind of floats and bounces. I, I can see that work. Yeah. Okay. Get you a good clap of the reed. No, I I can see that what working. Is, good. Uh, Brian makes custom calls. Let's uh, give us. A, can you give us his? Uh, I mean, does he just do it for friends and family, or he he's said got he's got a little pen there? there? Does he have a? I mean, what's the name of his stuff there, Kyle? Yeah. No, we'd be be happy to give him a shout. I like and, that brass button idea. That's slick. yeah. I think my the grunt that I use that woods one or the hooks one or whatever it is is um it's got a little tab on the back too. I think that one's plastic on the reed. Mm-hmm. Um, but same thing to get that like you said that bounce, you know, it's perfect for that. It's gonna give that little heavy when yeah. you click. Yeah, absolutely. And Jimmy says, I got 26 acres on my hunting property, multiple picks of a mature 10, couple active eights and sixes, and very few scrapes and rubs. Any insight? Mock scrape. It could, well, <laughs> it could It could just be the fact that at this point of the season, the, the, I'm seeing scrapes start to tail off. You know, they're, they're going into breed mode. They're not going into laying down sign mode and, mm-hmm. you know, and going out and around everywhere. Um the other thing is, is it might be back in some of the, the thicker bedding cover and not somewhere where you're seeing it, yeah, you know, it's 20, out there and obvious. If it's 20, yeah, James, if you're um, 26 acres is, you know, a very open part of the woods. I mean, that's going to happen. I mean, something that you can do to your 26 acres is you can you can create a little thicker habitat for them to try and hold them if that is the case. Mm-hmm. And try and get them to, I guess, feel a little safer in that block. Um, I guess I don't really know the full situation there. But, uh, yeah, and I mean, rubs and scrapes is all all relative. You know what I mean? So, yeah, I mean, I, I wouldn't say litter your property. I would almost be more turned off with a property that's got hundreds of scrapes than one that's got 10 or 12 really good scrapes in the right spots. Um, and like I've talked about before, I take out scrapes a lot of times, especially around stand locations. If it's not my, my mock along my travel pattern or whatever, I'll take it out. And then uh, um, I'm guessing James is Jimmy off of Jimmy. Yep. Off of YouTube. Yep. So uh, Jimmy, um, I guess the, I guess wherever, you just, I guess what I would do is just whatever bedding that you have closest to you on your 26 acres, I would try hunting that the closest, um, as close as you can get to that. And, um, you know, just try and do some of your blind calling you were doing. But if, uh, but yeah, if your 26 acres is pretty open hardwood, hardwoods, um, it's That's, kind of a mix. I mean, yeah, Jimmy's a client of yours. Yeah, so you know. Yeah. yeah. Um. So, so I'll let you talk on this. Yeah. Yeah. Know. So it it I'm would be flap my lips. I don't even no, know what it would. About. Yeah. It's it's picking the right stands for the locations with those wind conditions, and then like Nate was saying, hunting around bedding areas and stuff. You know, being obviously something to key up on. But like we talk about hunting that bedding area, like a buck's using that bedding area, being downwind side of it, right conditions in it now, you know. Um, and then Jimmy's piece is, yeah, he just commented on it. It's it's pretty thick other than, you know, the food plots that we've knocked in on it. Um, I think there could be some pockets open because he's got quite a bit of autumn olive as one of the invasives he struggled with because it was old pasture or cleared ground. And then it's just, we've grown back up to that um so it's kind of tough and it's almost sometimes impenetrable thick so it's almost like you know you got to open up some pockets with it but again like we talk about 
with budget and stuff like that. And I know he's got other pieces that he works on too. Um, you can only do, you know, the butter only gets spread so thin with projects and time, time being the most important one, you mm -hmm. know, cause that's, you know, you want to invest it in the best way time wise, but, um, that piece that, that could be a slamming piece. I mean, he had a world-class bucket on there uh, COVID year. So two years ago, 2020, um, world-class buck. And he had COVID at the time when he was lighting up the cell camera. Um, yeah. Damn COVID. Yeah. Damn COVID. But world-class buck. No, it was, it was a stud, but. Yeah, no, it, it the piece can it can it's gonna work. It does work. I mean, he's killed some some deer off of it or whatever. Yeah, the fifteen pointer. Yeah, it was super solid buck, giant. Um, but yeah, so with those pieces, especially small parcels, dude, it it gets tough. You know, not getting discouraged on them. I think a lot of times for people, you know, just because it, it's only a twenty six acre snapshot too you know, of what's going on in the neighborhood. You know, if your neighbor's putting a lot of pressure on one side of it, that could blow all the deer out through your 26 acres pretty quick too. It might not even be the way you're hunting it. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes it's just tough to, you know, to balance what other people are doing around you. Um, but it is a piece and, you know, with the right plan and stuff, I, I see it coming together, you know, for him. And, you know, he's got another piece too that he hunts as well. So it's, it's definitely uh, good to have the right plan in place and hunt it smart. That's the biggest thing coming back to just hunt it smart. It's proved 1,000%. Ooh, Ben got a shout-out on his own park. Look at that. Well, I, I appreciate that. Wow. You do know what you're that. talking about. Yeah. Well, I practiced a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Jimmy. I appreciate it, man. No, it's like I said, it's it can be a grind. And, I mean, even if you got – 60 acres 100 acres 200 acres like i said last year you know i got access to hunt probably between all the parcels maybe 400 acres total and 500 acres i didn't kill buck last year now part of that was you, were you know, picky. Being, being a little pickier yeah and stuff like you that had too, your but, sights on a specific animal but again you know you still gotta have them be in the wrong place at the wrong time no matter how good your stand is you still gotta have them deer gotta cooperate be at the wrong place at the wrong time for them so but no jimmy i appreciate that no it means a lot and like i said i mean if you guys can see it actually in the video see if you can see it i can't I don't even know yeah so this over here this is something i'm working on i actually filled this one up and with the rest of the pictures i got to print out um I'll have a second one, but this is going in my office. And then I got another one, the same size. These are all successful client kills this whole board behind me. And then I got another one over here that are going up in my office. I was down here working on that the other night. Mm -hmm. So just something I can look at, make me smile. I'm not big on sharing, you know, client photos and stuff like that around um, unless they ask me to or something like that. Um, you know, I've shared a few of them and stuff like that throughout the years, but you know, um, yeah, it's something that I enjoy doing. Like I said, I'm I'm happy to do it, dude. I love getting those text messages, and it's just that picture or that big buck down text from a client or something like that, followed by the picture. Or you know, maybe it was you know, like you said, their their daughter killed their first deer, or you know, mm -hmm. their um, the one lady. I I don't think she'd killed a buck in five six years, and the year after I was out there, she killed her buck first buck in like five six years. Mm -hmm. you know killed the biggest buck off of that property the following year after that, that they've ever killed off of it and owning it mm -hmm. so you know i love that i love that it means means so much to me to hear back the positive stuff on the 10 cup side of everything for sure uh, jimmy says i think one of the best things i learned from you was that the off-season work can be even more important than what you do during season I mean, yeah. I mean, there's a reason why it's we a, call call it a 12 month a year. It's a it's a year round process. Yeah. If you're into it mm -hmm. and you want to be continually successful year to year, mm -hmm. it's uh it's a 
it's a yeah 12 yeah. months of the I'm, year you're I'm, you're thinking about it you're planning it you're executing your plan you're and even if it's not like doing food plots and like land or habitat work or something like that even if it's just out scouting or mm-hmm. shed hunting or whatever it might be to help familiarize yourself with that way of a property and what i like to do too um and i've done before after i've killed a buck or something like that in certain scenarios is i'll backtrack almost where that deer came from you know and try to get a feel for okay why'd that deer come through here like that especially if it wasn't what i was anticipating um maybe he circled out of this bedding area and then i maybe make a note of that um you know to to pick up what other little tidbit might be helpful to help me kill the next deer out of that spot or maybe it's yeah this stands good but it's not great and then you start backtracking it or even following you know where the blood trail goes or leads to maybe you might find another and i've done that before found another spot so close to where i just killed a deer and then set up on that spot because i'm like wow this is so much better this is much much better positioning or better way to get on and off with a hill or a roll or something that you know, there's a whole bunch of different things that I've seen over the years with it, but I think the off season, um, I definitely put more work into my off season, scouting, habitat work, hunting, planning, etc. cetera, um, than I do during my in season, because I think it also limits the amount of time you have to spend in season because you're so much more prepared. Mm-hmm. I think it, yeah, know, I would agree with that. I mean, that's the, that's why you're doing all the work so you can enjoy your time out there trying to, mm-hmm. you know, you know, you know, I guess reap what you sowed. I yep. mean, that's, that's the, it's kind of the motto there. Yep. Um, you know? Yeah, no, I, I definitely, and I, I enjoy it. I enjoy my, my tractor time and my four wheeler planting time. And if I can drag Nate out there to help me break my four wheeler and my cult packer, I'll do that too. So that's always fun. Mm-hmm. But, um, but no, definitely the off season is is where you can you know jump and get ahead way more ahead than just you know going in two weeks before season and flustering stuff around and stuff like that. Yeah, whether it's you know moving a stand or um, setting your cameras up or going out there, something Ben had me try this year with his old tin cup mix. I've, I've always hunted permission pieces. I've never owned my own piece. Um, so I've always been limited on what I was able to do. I was always trying to hunt the deer for what the farmer left out there or, mm-hmm. you know, or the, just by the terrain. And so this year I got to mess around with a little, uh, what'd you call the outlaw plot? Yep. Got to go in there and spread some of your old tin cup mix out there and it's they're not hitting it too much but there is a there's a nice hue of green there is a nice and i planned it because i wanted it (laughs) i wanted it to be my marker for bow season so i planted it out in the field the bean field like about a 30 to 35 yard radius so i knew if anything touched the green green means go Mm -hmm. i can get them yep but uh it's kind of tough there because the the neighboring farm um, doesn't tend to get their crops off too early. Yep. So there's there's always a lot of food around there. <laughs> so food plots aren't always the aren't always the greatest greatest I guess in that area. And I guess that obviously applies to I guess probably a lot of people. Yeah. Um, but I definitely anticipate I think later in the later season later gone i think they'll definitely you get some snow i think they'll get them out there digging around in there yeah for sure and it's it's definitely more of a i experimented with it but it's definitely more of a gun stand really than a bow stand in my opinion the one up on top yeah yeah on the top of the head yep uh jimmy commented back in i know access is something you focus on a lot can you speak a little more of that for the novice hunter so um very rarely well i can't say that um 
not very often is my way into a stand the shortest distance from where I park my truck to the stand. Very rarely is it necessary, like a straight line in. You know, sometimes you got to go around a bedding area or you got to go down a hedge row to get around to it and not walk across the wide open field because it's easy to get to. You know, um, that's that's what I, I mean with the access. And also being conscious of when you're walking in, like I said, maybe you walk around a bedding area rather than walk on this side of, you know, walking on this side of a bedding area, bedding area being here, but your stand's over here and you want to hunt it with like that southwest wind. Well, that whole time you walked into that stand, you blew your scent into that bedding area before you even got to the stand. You know, I would rather go all the way around if you can, you know, sometimes it's limited by property lines, you know, to get around that bedding area and get on the back side of it that way, rather than just maybe taking a straight shot down the edge of a hay lot, overgrown field, something like that. Mm -hmm. um, being critical about how you get to your stand and then how you leave your stand um, just lessens your impact on the woods. You know, that's that woodsmanship coming back into it again. Yeah, and uh, I think I can touch on that pretty good, mm -hmm. um, breaking it down for... I guess more of a novice hunter or beginner. Mm -hmm. um, so a lot of, I guess a lot of, a lot of people, you know, like myself have permission pieces or hunt public. Um, so, you know, go to the aerial view. Um, Onyx is a great tool. Um, if you got 30 bucks to spend for the year subscription, I highly recommend it. But look at it and like ben said with property lines so let's say your only access is on the south end of that property okay you know that's where the farmer's barns are or the road. whatever the road that's where you can park or the driveway whatever it is you can only access from the south end because it's just cut out out of a wood block but you can hunt that let's say 40 acres so if I'm accessing on the south end and I, the neighbors from the west, the neighbors from the east, the neighbors from the north, they, they're all hunters. They do not want you to access that piece. Mm -hmm. And that seems to be the case for a majority. Or you're just too busy and you don't really have the time to drive around and figure out everybody and ask if you can just yep. walk across their property to go hunt your stand. So you park your truck in the south end you're walking north because that's where all the cover is that's where the wood block is let's say there's a hay field out front or something well if you have a south wind i wouldn't even i wouldn't even hunt it because, unless you can blow it adjacent off or something yeah i mean i mean i'm, I'm talking for the yeah i'm talking for the novice hunter here mm -hmm. i mean if you have a south wind and you're walking in and that wind is heading in the same direction that you're headed into the cover. I mean, you're just blowing all your scent right in to where all the deer are. Yep. You know, I mean, when you're accessing a property, I like to look at the wind direction. I like the wind when I'm accessing to be, I guess, like you said, kind of a little adjacent to my side or directly blowing me in the face. I'm not blowing out a piece as I'm accessing it, you know, mm -hmm. the winds kind of like we touched going through a bedding area or maybe is, there isn't a bedding area. Maybe, you know, it's just a 20 acre piece of timber mm -hmm. and that's what you have to hunt. Well, why would you want your scent as you're accessing just blowing completely through that timber where the majority of those animals that you're trying to hunt are there? Yep. You don't want that. You know, you want to get in and have your scent either blowing onto the neighbors blowing back out to where you're accessing. Um, I would definitely, I guess for a novice hunter, just for a simple tip that will definitely improve, um, I guess your, the deer you see out in the woods. The success rate. Is, yeah. is, and then you, then you can kind of grow from there with a little more of what you were touching on is just, just kind of access with wind. I mean, if, if that's the piece and, you know, a south wind is just how it's set up, and you're just going to blow all your scent into the woods. Just take day off. 
Nope. You know, unless it's or a know. different piece or whatever. Yeah, or go hunt a different piece if you have it. But you know, if it's set up like I said, and you're accessing from the south, and you have a west, east, or northern wind where you can get that crosswind kind of blown across you onto the neighbors, or that north wind that's blowing all your scent back to where your truck's parked. I mean, that is kind of what I would pay a little more attention to for the novice hunter. Pay attention to the wind on your access because you don't want to cut that wind and have your wind blow across everything that you're trying to hunt. And you you don't know it because you don't mm-hmm. know any better, but you just blew out the whole property you're trying to hunt before your hunt even started. Yep. Yeah, and it, it depends on how the habitat lays out. And this is where it gets just a little bit trickier with it. Sometimes you hunt features on a neighbor's and what i mean by that is like i'll blow scent over to a neighbor's wide open harvested ag field like something where they chopped corn early in september i'll blow my scent out into a big ag field Mm -hmm. um or if it's wide open timber with no topography in it i might blow my scent out into there because very little chance you're going to hit a deer in that you know or i'll blow it out over the top of a bottom or you know, there's a bunch of different ways you can, you know, look at your wind with that too. But yeah, you got a steep drop off. You can probably get away with blow it over the top. You know, there's there's other things that you'll and you'll figure out and learn. And then there's other spots you'll look at and be like, I think it's going to do this. And then you get in there and try to hunt it. And for whatever reason, it swirls funny. The wind does something weird. The trees push it a different. I mean, you you still don't know until you set the stand. You can get a good idea with the more stands you look at and the more spots you look at, but there's still no hundred percent. I mean, I had a couple spots over the last four or five years that I thought were just going to be dynamite. And I get down in them with those conditions and I, the stands aren't there anymore. It just doesn't work. The wind, the thermal, everything just doesn't work for that spot. Mm -hmm. Um, Or there's some of them that I've learned that you need to have dead calm day, sunny, sunny sky rising, and you can sit it whenever Mm -hmm. or it's you need a hard west with some stands you know or whatever yeah and that's just that's just learning pieces and learning how the wind works on a piece too but for a novice hunter i would definitely say access number one i would pay attention to wind yep you don't want you don't want yeah you don't want to ruin your piece before your hunt starts because that makes for a long day Mm -hmm. (laughs) in a boring long season in a boring day yep in a long season ahead of that but yeah so good questions by jimmy good questions by platt good questions by everybody commenting in and uh was it kyle was the other guy that was commenting in i want to make sure because kyle is a new commenter yep kyle he, he's a new commenter so yeah, i was kind of hoping he'd drop that uh call name yep yep and jimmy says the other thing is stay off deer trails yeah. that's yeah don't huge. leave your don't leave your boot marks and where the deer are going yep yeah no that's that's another good tip too for even though yeah even if you're wearing rubber boots they still smell you no yeah they smell i think they smell a lot of that ground disturbance or whatever too um which you know um this is one my wife's probably gonna go upstairs right and she's probably upstairs right now watching this or tuning in and she's unless she got called into work but um, she's probably going to cringe when I say this. But the other thing, too, is unless I kill a deer, and this is just it goes back to new hunters, and if you start getting into this kind of, you know, flow with how you, you know, prep and take care of your hunting clothes and stuff like that, um, especially boots. Boots and the outer layer, the stuff that's going to be exposed to the vegetation and where you're walking in, that stuff – the only time I have it on my body is when I'm in the woods. That does not go in my truck. That does not go to the gas station. That does not go to the polling booth the other day. Like I saw people walk in in full hunting garb, Yeah, you know, um, unless I kill. And then at that point, you know, I don't feel like changing. I want to celebrate <laughs> Yeah. That's different, but um, a big thing is keeping keeping boots clean, I think, is the biggest one. Mm-hmm. Um, I'll wear Crocs or, you know, something like that when I'm driving to a stand in my truck and boots are in the back. Mm-hmm. Um, and then I get, you know. I mean, 
bacteria grows on moisture and yep. bacteria is what's going to smell. Mm -hmm. So the number one thing, if you don't have access to ozone or um, whatever scent control you like to scent use, control you like to use, keep your stuff dry and keep it, I guess, non sweaty. <laughs> yeah. I mean, don't, don't keep it with your, you know, the dress clothes you're going to wear to the wedding the following weekend. Yep. You know, don't keep it in your closet. I mean, people like to put things in a tote. Um, I have, I have a, I have a clean tote and I have a dirty tote. So I'll get like, and this is just me. I get one or two hunts out of like a base layer mm -hmm. and then I'll put that in the dirty tote. Mm -hmm. Or if I got really sweaty walking in, I'm only get one hunt out of my base layer before I got to put it in the dirty bin. So I got multiple of the same base layer. And then my outers, like I said, the only time I wear my outers, I'll take another one. Um, is when I get to my spot, mm -hmm. there's no truck running, no exhaust, and I have my base layer on, and I'm getting dressed on my boot mat um, so I don't get my socks and my feet wet because, like you said, that bacteria is going to grow in moisture. I don't want to be putting wet feet and wet socks into boots. Boot dryer is huge. Boot dryer, keeping that dry and all and that stuff. If, and if you do have the means to get the ozone stuff, I highly recommend it. I am a big fan of the, the ozone generators. Um, for scent control. For clothes in the trees, I don't think it does a whole heck of a lot. Um, and I don't recommend breathing it in because ozone is a natural known carcinogen. Mm -hmm. um, you know, so being in closed spaces with it. But what I'll do is if I do run one in my truck or something like that, um, I'll run it for a while and then run it through a cycle or two or whatever. And then I will um, unplug it and then roll my windows down to let it air scent itself out the rest of the way before I climb into it. Um, I mean, I'll, I go to the extent of before I go hunting, I will actually turn that little ozone generator on in my truck and uh, let it run for a while and also do maybe a five to ten minute ozone cycle on my outer layers before I go out. Um. Because the ozone only lasts so long. It's it's only going to last as long as it's actually running. Mm -hmm. Then after it quits, everything just starts up again. Um, the scents and all that. Um, and, you know, even to keep it in your garage, uh, ozone kills stink bugs and everything. They do not like it. They will not get in it if you run yep. it frequently in your hunting stuff. Yep. I know everyone's got issues with stink bugs. Um, I guess... But I, I do about the same thing Ben does. Um, I, I just really focus on my outer layers and what will be in contact with stuff. I mean, I wear my, I wear a compression layer. Um, and then I wear a cotton layer, like a long john layer. And then I will wear a cotton layer, like sweatpants or, and then I always wear a cotton turtleneck. Um, and then if it's a windy day and it's, you know, super cold, I will throw on a wind layer, like a windbreaker. Mm -hmm. And then I will throw on my insulated hour layers over all of that. And that windbreaker is actually huge. And then for my hands, I never really wear really thick gloves. I always just keep my hands either in, I guess if you have one of them little hand warmer pouches, mm -hmm. I, I, I wear the same gloves all year round, pretty much. Mm -hmm. um, they're just a simple thin layer glove, but I wear, I always bring a thing of hot hands. Um, I do actually have some, uh, a, a little, a little funny tip, I guess mm -hmm. <laughs> that, uh, I don't know. Some people might like, some people might not, but Hey, so it's called hunting a hunting beer. <laughs> I know that's probably not the greatest thing to talk about, but every once in a while I'll bring a couple beers out in my pack, sit in the stand, and and the beers I do bring are the aluminum twist top cans. Uh, Coors makes them, and I think Miller mm. makes them. But uh, um, yeah, I I'll sit there and I'll enjoy my beer. Um, if you're uh a tobacco chewer um you could use it as a spitter so you're not spitting all over your 
hunt and stand. Um, and then, you know, if it's, it's cold out and you got to pee, um, you can pee in that can and you can screw the top back on it. And it's a hand warmer for a solid 10 <laughs> to 15 minutes, a little redneck, a little hand redneck, <laughs> little redneck hand heater there. And, uh, yeah. that's the circle of life of, uh, of a hunting beer. But, uh, <laughs> yeah, I don't know. A little funny, little funny thing that my, my uncle always joked about and well, you know, we do from yep. time to time. I mean, that's what we're out there for. I mean, if, you know, obviously you don't want to go out in the woods drunk off your ass, but you go out there, sit in the stand, enjoy yourself and have a beer. I mean, I don't think there's anything wrong with that in my I don't opinion. Think so. No, like I said, like you said, just obviously knowing your moderation, but having one or something over a four or five hour set. Yeah, there ain't nothing wrong with it, in my opinion. I mean, some people might have some no other opinions on it, but yeah, it's uh true, true enough. Yeah, we're not out there drinking a whole bottle of whiskey or something like that and going out and <laughs> no, yeah, no. Sitting here waiting on a deer, you know, slinging bullets and missing. Luke Bryan saw him. Luke Bryan, yeah. Uh, (laughs) Drinking beer and wasting bullets. Yeah, we're not doing that. No. No. Uh, Liza said, probably shouldn't get in Nate's ozone closet then. Probably not the best idea. We were talking about it being a carcinogen and killing stink bugs and all that stuff. Oh, was she going to climb in it? I don't know. Yeah, Liza, if you plan on climbing in it, I don't know. Do not do that. I don't climb in it. <laughs> no. Uh, and then Jimmy says, I got an ozone generator for about 80 bucks on eBay. Piped it into a tote with a four-inch PVC. Run all my gear through it every evening hunt. And then in the morning right before I get up and go out. Mm-hmm. Yeah. The only thing so, with the ozone is, I will tell you, anything elastic. Yeah, don't put your harness in there. No. Yeah. No, no harness stuff. Well, the harness is... Uh, breakaways but i'm talking uh like face masks because if they have an elastic the waistbands on most base layers eat that right apart yeah breaks that down uh your o-rings for your grunt call also get shredded they don't last Mm -hmm. um so my grunt call um doesn't go in my ozone bag it goes in a little zipper pocket Mm -hmm. so it doesn't get the ozone sprayed on it um because it will it will eat it will eat elastics, um, just just does. My gloves, like the the cuffs on my gloves, are a little loose now because the little bit of elastic that held them tight to my wrist is ate up. Mm-hmm. You know, it definitely sucks the base layers though. You feel like you're on that biggest loser show, and you're at the end of it, and you pull your <laughs> waistband out, and it's like twenty <laughs> inches too big because it's all gone. All the elastic's gone out of it. See, I don't, I don't keep my base layers in there. I just keep my outers. Mm-hmm. Um, and then I have the um, ozone generated boot dryer. Mm-hmm. Um, I keep, I keep my outers just in like a tote or a scent bag in the house. I just take them off. Yep. Throw them in there, and then I, I just throw them back on. I don't run any lowers in them. I just do yeah, the scent free wash and. Mm-hmm. that's what i do and then they have they have their own tote it's my blue tote i call it because it's a non-ozone tote and that's that's where i have all my extra base layer pieces and i have extra bottoms yeah, extra tops i don't run too much the first time the first year i had the ozone i got a little crazy with it but mm-hmm. i don't think it's necessary i think it's i think it's more critical on your outers your boots yeah, the biggest thing is just not riding around in your truck going and getting fast food with your your hunting layers on pumping gas going yeah you know yeah obviously yes go vote not saying don't go vote but don't show up to the vote unless you got yeah unless you got unless you tagged yeah unless you got a rack hanging out of like sticking out of the back of your truck then hell yeah go pump your gas yeah (laughs) no absolutely but if you're going out the next morning i wouldn't be pumping gas with my hunting boots and my yeah stuff on and then same thing, I use my I use a different set of boots for hunting than I do for work versus walking around and scouting most of the time. Mm-hmm. So, you know, just being your, your hunting clothes are, I'm pretty religious, so to speak, about keeping that just for hunting. 
Mm. And just for deer hunting, like my turkey hunting clothes are different, you know, waterfowl, if I do do it, Mm -hmm. you know, I might use some of the stuff, but before it's going to go back in the deer woods, um, uh, it's got to be to the way I do it. Maybe it's a placebo effect. I don't know. Mm -hmm. Yeah, actually, it was kind of funny the Monday when I took Eliza out. Um, I actually threw all of my hunting stuff on before we went to the property and she goes, she goes, you're not putting it on when you get to the woods anymore or when you get to the hunting spot anymore. Cause she had all her stuff packed up, ready to go. You know? totes and... She was, she, you know, she was, she was doing it to the T yep. and I was like, well, you're the one that's supposed to be killing tonight. I said, I'm just up there for moral support. I said, <laughs> I'm just up there to help you drag it out. <laughs> yeah. I, was, I said, I'm not. I'm not getting too into it right now. I said, we're putting you in the honey hole. Yep. But, uh, yeah, she got after me. It was kind of funny. I kind of had to chuckle at that. Yeah. What do you mean? Why are you putting your hunt? Why are you putting your out, your outer layers on now? Aren't you going <laughs> to wait till we get to the spot? Yeah. I was like, man, you are listening. Yeah. No. And then sometimes like if I know it's the last hunt, I'll get out of a base layer, you know, maybe I'll wear that just driving in the truck to the spot. Mm-hmm. Um, especially if it's one of those twenty degree mornings, I don't feel like stripping down in my underwear and putting the base layer on when I get. To I get woods. lazy sometimes. Yeah, get lazy sometimes. Yeah, but like I said, the biggest thing is keeping that outer layer as clean as you possibly can. Yeah. Um. Yep, yeah. Sure. Well, it looks like commons died down. Where are we at with? Yeah, we're we're at a hour thirty six right now, so an hour and a half, which is usually how we do it. I mean, we do have the last kind of topic we had written down which was a basic scoring of a deer which we could do now or we could save it for next episode i think we What's save it for the next episode we're already an hour and a half into it i think it. hour and a half that's a pretty good time point for people so next week we'll do we'll do the teaser right now next week we'll do the um the live scoring of hornet i mean obviously not official it's still green um but we'll talk about why he's got a bunch of blue painters tape on him right now um and explain the basic scoring of a deer so yeah we'll go through all the the points the mass the spreads all that stuff with it um and we'll do a live score of him next wednesday mm-hmm. on the white tails and whiskey episode 11 for the I don't know. Everybody's been calling about eleven point with that little yeah. extra time. So, and if anybody, and if anybody's still listening, if you whoever gets the closest score, Ben will ship them out an old tin cup sweatshirt. I do have one still in the closet. We'll have, we'll have to take a poll at the beginning of it. Whoever gets closest to the score, closest to the pen, they get you get a milkweed pod, a milkweed. Uh, Dispenser. Coin, coin, yeah, milkweed coin purse. Coin purse and, and an old tin cup hoodie. hoodie. Yeah. If anybody wants to get in on that, if anybody's actually listening. Yeah, I can do that. Just uh I think I think that's pretty cool. Yeah. If we get some people to send us some messages either on the either on the book or the however you can do it. Yeah, we'll do it next. Throw week. us your score and whoever's closest. That'd be cool. Yeah. I'm game for if that. You're down for that. I'm giving away your stuff, but yeah, that's <laughs> <laughs> that's fine man all good all good but yeah thanks everyone for tuning in to episode 10 uh this will be live or sorry it'll be available after the live's over on youtube um to listen to as well as you can go back on the bullhorn app at any time uh, i'd like to get a little bit more people on the bullhorn app because of how cool that is with the call-in feature um that billy showed us a couple episodes ago so if you want to check it out over on the bullhorn app um I'd love to get some people calling in, telling us about their hunts and yeah, I'd love some to success see. or maybe some woe stories or yep. anything. Yeah, anything. It's like always that. fun to hear. You know, comments are one thing, but with the call-in thing, it's cool. Um, and we're talking about having you know people on in future episodes here coming up. Um, you know, some stuff like that going on too. But yeah, so thank you everyone. Uh, the other thing I was going to say, I guess before we sign off, lastly, uh, I just created a. Um, Facebook page specifically for the podcast um, and then once the viewership gets up we'll be doing the podcast directly live on that page mm-hmm. um, and then sharing it to whatever other page and stuff like that so um, if you have a chance uh, we'd appreciate if you go over to the White Tails and Whiskey podcast 
Facebook page, drop us a like, um, and we'll be putting up content over there. Um, you know, kind of keeping the clutter off of my personal page and everything else like that. And people have been asking about it. So it sounds like Jimmy's going to send us a score. He said he was already going to try. Uh, he's going to try the call in. Oh, he's going to try the call in. Yep, I oh, saw right. that trickle in when I was talking about that. So thank you, everyone. We appreciate it. Share it around your friends and family. We appreciate it if you like and subscribe and always enjoy having the conversations and answering your guys' questions. I appreciate having Nate on, like always. And uh, good luck to everybody still out there. And we'll see you next time down here at the Bragging Bar or at the Skin and Shed or wherever we're pod- podcasting from. You never know. You never know. Hopefully on a live blood trail one of these times. One of these times.